and welcome to Murphy's Garden and in this video um, I just want to reflect on the visit we did last week to Woolerton Old Hall. Um, we visited quite a wet day last week and I um, want to just go through some of the things that you can take away from Woolerton that perhaps you can use in your own garden. So a garden can be lots of things to lots of people. There can be lots of different styles from formal to cottage to prairie to Japanese all types of styles but what is it about an outside space that really makes it a garden? When I googled the word garden it said it's an area of land adjacent to a property in which flowers, shrubs and trees can be grown. Um, so that's one definition and I know in America um, that you refer to your um, back garden as your backyard, which is quite funny to us in here in the UK because a backyard to us has connotations of like um, Victorian terrace housing with back-to-back um, -back housing and the backyard was used more as a utilitarian space perhaps to dry laundry but um, and even like a schoolyard or a prison yard. A yard to us means um, just a, a utilitarian functional space. It's certainly devoid of any plants and not known for its horticulture. So I always find it quite surprising, or I did find it quite surprising when I first was new to YouTube, when an American took us on a tour of their backyard only to reveal a large, usually large and fabulous garden. So um, just some cultural differences between the two countries. So when we moved into our property back in 2009, we um, inherited a, quite a large space, a bit of a blank canvas really. It was just grass and a cherry tree which was cankered and some conifers and not really a lot else. So it was, I guess, should have been quite a daunting task. I don't think we find it daunting at the time. I think we were just quite excited. But we set about rather enthusiastically cutting out borders, um, kind of pencil thin borders around the edge of the grass and we put in some paths and we, we had a bit of a go really. And I remember at the time being rather pleased with ourselves. I think we thought we were doing quite well. And around this time, I visited some gardens locally. They had an open garden day in our local town and we went along and looked at some other people's gardens. And it was a lovely summer's day and in the gardens, they, all the gardens were completely different. And in, but in each garden, each garden felt kind of cocooned and it felt just a pleasant and nice place to be. And then we returned home to our garden and um, it was like a different day. The sunny day had gone, it was blowing a gale in our garden where the plants that I had planted, the cosmos that I'd tentatively looked after and brought on were getting buffeted about by the wind. And instead of that nice feeling, I felt really, I remember at that pivotal moment, I felt really quite depressed and disillusioned and thought my garden just didn't have that feel that these other gardens did have. And it was at that moment that I realized that a garden is so much more, anyone can plant nice flowers and nice plants, but a garden is so much more than just healthy, pleasant looking plants. It's all about the feel of the garden and how it makes you feel. And I guess that's why big estates like National Trust Houses um, they've got all the lovely ground, but why, the, why do they still plant, uh, why do they still build walled gardens? It's to give that kind of cocooned feeling. It's human nature. We want to feel sheltered from the elements and feel cocooned and secret. So I think that's really um, what I realised at that point. And it was not long after that that we um, visited, I came across the, the garden of Woolerton Old Hall and I visited it. And... Um, it just encapsulated everything I wanted a gar my garden to be. I had no idea how to get there, of course, but I knew that I really, really liked it. So I brought my husband and children, who were quite little at the time, we came along and luckily for us, it was quite a wet day. A uh, wet day is a really good time to visit a garden because nobody else is there. Uh, all the fair weather people don't come. So we're, we're our waterproofs. The children played and wandered up and down all the magical little paths, uncovering um, all these secret little areas in the garden. It was at that point that um, while the children played, Alistair and I just stood and just, we couldn't sit because it was wet everywhere, but we stood and studied the garden and tried to fathom what it was about this garden that really, really worked. So we studied how it had been constructed and the design, not the flowers, not the plants at this stage, just looking at the core structure. So. Um, in this video, I'm not a, a garden designer by any means, but I want to just reflect on what I learned as an amateur gardener when I first started or new to gardening and what I've learned from that garden that you um, may find useful and you may find you can use elements of this in your own garden. 
So making a garden that envelops you and stimulates all your senses is no easy task. It's quite hard. And when I showed the video last week of our visit last week, I had a comment from someone who said it, the garden at Woolerton really reminded her of Inga Moore's illustrations of the book, The Secret Garden. And I think that really um, hit the nail on the head, really. That's what it's about, isn't it? It's about that kind of childlike discovery of a garden. It's so exciting. So um, I'm going to go through some 12 elements from Woolerton that I think are important to create a good garden. So the first point is to divide up the garden. I'm sure you will have heard this many times, but if you can see the entirety of the garden from the back door, then the garden's boring and um, there's no reason to go out and explore and to look right up the top of the garden. Why bother if you can see it? So um, dividing the garden up really helps that. Now Woolerton is four acres and it's been divided up into 14 separate gardens. Um, uh, if you've got a smaller garden, then obviously you don't need to divide it up into that many. But certainly a small garden, don't think because your garden is small that you shouldn't do this. In fact, if anything, dividing up will make a small garden seem much bigger. And sometimes by giving an area a name, um, that will really help you understand what it is you want from that area. So um, say, for example, the white garden. The white garden will be restful. It will be full of white colours and greens and very peaceful place to be. An area in the garden where you can stop and breathe before entering another part. A hot garden, for example, will be full of um, colours or vine for your attention. It will stimulate your senses. Um, so giving a garden a name immediately makes you both, if, you, if you're part of a couple, if you, you understand what it is you both want from that, that area. In this area, this is what we call this area, the parterre, and it was done in a rather tongue-in-cheek way because at the time it was just a grass with a load of weeds and rubble and I used to call it the parterre and even the children who were quite little at the time used to say about the parterre which made everyone laugh. But I had the last laugh because we worked slowly and patiently over a period of years and now I have got my rose parterre and it's everything I wanted it to be. My advice is to call the area what you want it to be and then work towards that goal. Number two is to obscure the view. This follows on a bit from um, the dividing the area up into rooms. So in between each of the rooms, if you have um, obscure the view, this works really well. It stops you being able to see into the next zone and sparks, the cu sparks one's curiosity. So, or maybe nosiness, um, but it makes you want to see what lies beyond. So what Woolerton does really well, it brings hedges in very, very tight. Sometimes that you have to squeeze through them, but brings them in tight only to open up the view and reveal what's beyond. And that gives a sense of wow factor in the garden. So they do that again and again at Woolerton and every time it works. So that's another good tip. I do remember in our top borders, we had, a, we had an open garden and it was at the stage actually it was a bit too uh, soon to open our garden to the public, but some people came and I remember being a bit miffed at the time because the borders up the top I had weeded um, on my hands and knees the week before after work till late at night, getting it all ready for people seeing my garden and some people didn't even bother to walk up to the top and the reason was is that they didn't need to because they could see it the hedges although these hedges had been planted they were still quite diddy so um, the the view wasn't obscured so there was no reason to walk up to the top so it would be quite interesting to see whether people now do walk up to the top i don't know number three is to add focal points so like your room in a house, any room in a house it needs to have a focal point, so something that draws you in. So in, for example, a living room, it might be, you might have a fireplace or the bed, the bedroom, it might be the bed that you have beautifully decorated with cushions and, you know, nice throws and things. So some sort of focal point and the garden is just the same. So within each of your rooms have a destination. It might be a seating area. It could be a statue. If it's a transitional part of the garden, which this is in the parterre, people just pass through it. There's nowhere to sit and linger, but have archways that lead on, entice the, the eye towards the destination and where, where, you want that, what, where you want the person to go. So always have a focal point in a garden. And Woolerton does that, uses um, lots of seating and archways and um, all sorts of things to do that. 
Number four, once you know what your focal point is, frame it and frame it well. A bit like a picture in a house. You wouldn't just put a picture um, up on the wall, you add a frame to it. And this can be an intricate frame or it can be quite a contemporary frame, depending on the look you want. So if, for example, you've got a, um, a seat or a, or a statue, adding layers of hedging around that um, frames the view. And Woolerton does this using um, plants. It can be with um, trees or hedges. It can be with um, and contrasting colours can also really work very, very well. So always try and frame the view. And in our area, the, um, the quadrant area, where we've got four borders, what we have put some um, uh, beach hedging in, Vega Slovatica either side, but what we intend to do is to put two pillars at the side and it's all about building this framework so that it frames the view going up and the, the, the view bounces all the way up the garden from right down at the very bottom of the house. So the next point is the layers. So we have a, a bit of a jokey phrase that we say, it's all about the layers, gardens and indeed houses are all about the layers that you add. And what I mean by that is um, these are the things that aren't necessary. So they're perhaps not the things you will do straight away, but it's something to build on as you polish your garden and make it look better and better. So a bit like an outfit, you can have a nice dress, but with a nice um, with some nice jewellery that really adds to the look and completes your outfit and gives you that polished, more classy look. So that's what the layers are about. It's about things like um, embellishments, perhaps like at Woolerton, we saw the egghorns on the top of the posts or um, insects in the path. They're not there for any reason other than to look good. And even at Woolerton, we saw fences, um, metal fencing and gateways. They're not there to keep anyone in or anyone out, but they're there purely just to add layers in the garden, to add that interest and to make the garden really, really special. So we went in our garden to a reclamation yard and bought some little um, little stone things and we've also got metal archways that we've added to just a blank brick wall. It's those little details that really, really add to a garden and that's sometimes where you haven't perhaps got the budget at the beginning to do all that, but that's something definitely to do later on once you've got the hedges and the, the core structure in. So following on from the layers is punctuation. So like any sentence, it needs punctuation and a garden is the same. So punctuation, I mean full stops. Um, so for example, along a path, you can have, you could just have box all the way along, but by punctuating the points where you want, perhaps, perhaps where another path joins it, that will help to um, add rhythm to the garden. So Woolerton does this very well using um, like box balls or pyramids of view. They have the pyramids of view up close to the front of the border and that just makes your eye bounce all along the, the, um, the repetition, makes your eye bounce all along the border. And we've done it with um, obelisks in our big borders. We've done it with box um, here in the parterre. We've got these um, punctuations of pyramid um, box um, and we've done it, we've tried to do it throughout the garden. I guess we could do it a little bit more than we have, but that's, that's what I mean by um, punctuation. Number seven is immersive planting. So I'm not going to get into the actual plants that you're going to choose, but it, more about the, the borders themselves. So as I said, when we first moved in, we planted these um, pencil borders around the edge of the grass. And I think a lot of people new to gardening do do that. But over a period of time, we realised that for the garden to feel, to get that feeling of, um, of enclosure, you want to be immersed in the planting. So in this, the area down um, the four quadrants, we cut out the grass and brought the grass, brought the borders in tighter. And we see that at Woolerton with the, um, in the circular area where they've got four borders, they've done the same. They bring the planting right in and that's not that relevant at this time of year um, when, the, when the planting is still quite small. But as the summer goes on and the plants get big and the flowers get big, when you're in that area, it makes you feel enclosed. And a bit going back to that kind of childlike feeling that we discussed with them, um, the secret garden, perhaps it makes us feel smaller um, when the plants seem bigger and we're kind of looking up at them, it's more impressive and more perhaps more magical. Number eight on my list are areas of calm. So after exuberant planting and the excitement of seeing lots of different colours and um, this exuberance, it's quite nice just to calm down. So like a very excited toddler who's very, very hyper and excited, just sit them down and calm them down and breathe and soothe them. And a garden is the same. So passing from 
one area which is quite stimulating. It's nice to have an area which is calming and perhaps full of white and tranquil water does it very well. Woolerton uses it in the um, rail garden, the upper rail garden, which is just tranquil um, water and it uses just very green colours and um, nothing that kind of clashes or stands out. So um, that's always a good thing to do and we've done that in our, we call it the sunken garden. Now the sunken garden in our garden was the first area we did and you will see that it is really copied, plagiarised directly from Woolerton. Um, at the time we, we, when I, we visited Woolerton we came back and we just wanted to have a go and create something so we didn't have a clue what we were doing so we thought we'll just copy someone who, who did know what they were doing so we copied Leslie and John's um, they call it the, the old garden and we find out what the trees were they're Portuguese um, laurels or Prunus lusitanica and we bought four of them and we set about um, sort of copying the the design that they had and certainly our own version of it and I think um, taking inspiration from another garden it never it never ends up being looking exactly the same it's always an interpretation so it's a form of flattery I suppose but um, it does look quite similar so that's the reason and I think buoyed by the success of this part of the garden the first one that we actually designed properly um, it, it gave us confidence to then experiment and have a free run with our own ideas and ideas that we took from magazines and things to go on and, and be a bit more confident in our own ability. The area, the sunken garden, is also shaded. So it's got the big cherry tree that um, casts it into shade. It's partial, partially shaded. So it's a nice area to be from that perspective because as well as it looking cooler with the whites and the greens, it also feels cooler. So that's always quite nice as well if it is a shaded part of the garden. And we've backed it with some um, pleached lime trees as well. Number nine on my list is less grass. So you'll be surprised to know that although Woolerton is um, about four acres in total, there's actually very little grass, you will notice. Uh, there are some areas of grass along the formal parts of the garden pathways, um, and there are some bits of grass in the sort of more informal, the shrub area, which I think they call the croft down the bottom of the garden, but there really isn't a lot. Um, and the grass that there is, is very, very tightly edged, very strongly edged. Um, we've done the same in our garden. We've now got um, metal edging um, down in this part of the garden and we've edged it at the top with um, some little, I um, can't remember what they're called, little brick runners up the top. So um, edging the grass really sharply and tightly really complements the rest of the borders because um, having a sharp, tight looking grass and then the explosion of planting looks good in the height of summer. Now there is um, a real craze at the moment, um, certainly here in the UK, for not mowing. No mow may was a thing, a thing last year or the year before. Um, I think you need to do this, exercise this with great caution. Fine if it's a wildlife garden or perhaps under trees and things like that, but be very, very careful of just leaving grass to go wild near herbaceous borders. I know several people that followed this advice and bitterly regret it because what happens is it, you very rarely get wild orchards and beautiful things growing. You tend to get dandelions and nettles and rather nasty things that then seed themselves all over the border and choke out all your lovely herbaceous perennials. And the herbaceous perennials, most of them provide a lot more um, advantages to nature than do the, um, the weeds. So um, I would be very, very careful about using this approach um, and do that with caution. So we have still got a fair bit of grass in this garden, but we are definitely taking out more and more. And I think the advantage of that is because what I find in the summer when all the plants are looking their best, the grass dies. We're having, you know, much, you know, drier summers and also grass is very time consuming. If you're busy working, you've got a lot on your plate. The demand of grass cutting for, you know, several hours every weekend is, is quite a lot really. So I think the less grass you have, probably the better really. It does still look nice in places, but we're definitely removing a lot more. Number 10 is to use interesting shapes. So we'll see at Woolerton the repeat of certain shapes and they use triangles, they use um, in the form of like the U pyramids, they use circles in the form of box balls and, and U balls and they also use um, 
the use these shapes repeated again in this in the shape of the borders and the cut out of like the rill and the and the um, areas under planting and they also use it in the stone sets so some in some parts of the garden go back to the area by adding layers um, sometimes they have a pathway which is just a gravel pathway and for no reason other than that it looks good they add little crisscrosses of um, of like cobble sets in the gravel and that looks really lovely and it just repeats these shapes over and over again and it adds continuity to the garden so I think that looks good um, they've also used like in the obelisk you see the triangle of the um, obelisk roof which mirrors the the house roof so it's mirroring um, shapes that are seen again and again and throughout the garden and I think we've tried to do that in this garden too um, we've got square windows, we've got a Georgian farmhouse with square windows so we initially put in some trellis which reflected these little squares. We have since taken that out, those of you that watch the videos will know. Um, but we've also tried to use circles and um, pyramids and things in our hedging, in our box and our yew hedging and the um, Portuguese laurels as well. And the next thing, number 11 on my list, is um, vertical structure and height. So if a garden looks too flat, it's just not very interesting. So you need to have elements of height in the garden. And Woolerton does this really well using like, the pyramids, the big, tall pyramids of you. And some of them are really up close to the border, and that just looks good. And they've also done it with quite majestic looking trees. And in the real garden, we saw the upper real garden, we saw these um, Carpinus spectralis, the vestigiate hornbeams, um, again, just creating that height. Um, and they've also done it with lots of buildings throughout the garden. So um, little summer houses and archways and pergolas and all those things really help to give some vertical interest in the garden. And we've tried to do that in our own garden with archways and um, and you, um, you know, we've got the um, fastidiate yews in our garden and the, um, the Portuguese laurels. And one of the biggest features in our garden for giving height, really valuable height, is the um, bleached hornbeam walk. So we put one row in that was used to screen neighbours, but then we recognised that it looked much better as an avenue. So we added the second row and that's achieved that um, vertical interest that we need in the, in the garden. So a lot of the 11 points that I've mentioned so far are things, features that we see time and time again in really well designed gardens and we've seen it when we visited and seen um, the show gardens at Chelsea and we'll see some more when we come to visit in the next few weeks. But the next point is something that isn't often seen in um, domestic gardens and I suspect that's possibly why Chris Beach or the garden designer has identified Woolerton Old Hall as one of the finest examples of a domestic English garden because this is really hard to get right if you're an amateur gardener. Um, most of us and myself included have a garden and then evolve the garden over a period of time and the downside of that is sometimes the garden doesn't work cohesively as a whole. So um, I don't know whether um, Leslie and John sat down and designed the whole garden in one, in one go or whether it did evolve, but it's an incredibly clever garden and this is very, very difficult to get right. And the next point I'm going to talk about are access points. And I didn't appreciate this when I first visited the garden, probably the first or certainly the first few visits of visiting. It's only looking at it um, with a very critical eye that you can see this. And what Leslie's done, so we talked about focal points and um, you know, framing the view, but what she's managed to do, so in one garden you can have um, you know, a focal point at the end, but what she's happened to do is she's got focal points running transversely across the garden as well. So I'll use um, the rill garden as a good example of this. So she's got the rill and on either side she's got the Carpinus spatulus and then the pots of hydrangea. Um, but then in another part of the garden, she's used just one of those pots as the focal point to another garden. So she's used borrowed views. And as I say, the access points run across the garden. So that's why I perhaps suspect it's being designed from the outset. Um, most of us just evolve a garden and we did that. Um, the downside with that is that sometimes you can get it wrong. Um, so there are points where, where we designed the lower part of the garden and in fairness we didn't actually own this part of the garden up the top. So when we did own it we then put in the borders and find that the whole garden was out of alignment and we had to then make changes to 
put past, move pathways over and to move plants and things over, which is quite difficult to do um, retrospectively. So it's far better to design the whole garden in its entirety. So I think we've reached the end and I haven't even touched on what plants to plant. I think um, if we can, we'll visit the garden again over the summer months and marvel at um, not only Leslie's ability to get the design spot on, but also to um, plant so well as, as well. So that's something we can hopefully learn from too. So thank you very much for watching. And if you um, like what we do, please like and subscribe. And I need to get in now because I'm getting soaked. Thanks very much for watching. Bye for now.